on from here. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. So let's have the slides then. So I'm going to talk about um, take it a bit a, a step back and take a helicopter view on on airway management in critical illness. And this is really a wicked problem. And there's many ways to skin these cats. And I see here a lot of experience. I know a lot of faces here. And you all know how to handle these patients. So I, this is not a one right way to do it. This is my perspective on, on how to, to manage some of these patients. So um, in the emergency uh, community, Michael talked a lot about pathology and anat anatomy. Uh, but there's been increasing awareness in the emergency community that, that difficult airways also may stem from, from physiological problems. So my talk could also have been named the physiologically difficult airway, and this is what I want to talk about. And a lot of what I have to say is, is based on my experience, both from uh, clinical experience, obviously, but also from teaching and talking with some of the true airway masters that I know, Michael, Wendy, um, uh, Rich Leviton and uh, Scott Weingart, which most of you guys also know. Um, and I was very happy to see last year that the Difficult Airway Society, together with the Faculty of Intensive Care and the uh, Intensive, Intensive Care Society, published a new guideline on, on handling these uh, physiologically difficult airways. And really do encourage you to read these guidelines. They are very, 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 very well written and, and, and good. All right, so um, let's see. Who am I? Uh, Michael told me, told you that I also work in in, in his department, and uh, doing 50% ENT and max fax uh, anesthesia, uh, trauma anesthesia at our level one trauma center, where I also uh, work as a trauma manager and trauma team leader, and I also do a lot of pre-hospital work both with our mobile unit and our HEM service. So I, I do see a lot of uh, difficult airways and a lot of sick patients. Um, so the first thing I think about when I incurred, uh, encounter these patients is stop, slow down. You need to know that very, very few patients need an intubation right now, otherwise they will die. So this is what you need to do. Stop, slow down, think. And resuscitate before intubation. Resuscitation before intubation. And this is actually my take home message from this talk. Resuscitate before intubate. And from the NAP4 study in 2011 and highlighted by papers by Jerry Nolan the same year and the year after by Elizabeth Barringer, uh, that the combination of <coughs> airway management outside the OR with cri critically ill patients and staffing issues that is really a deadly cocktail. Outside the OR, obviously, they are all emergency intubations, they're non-fastened, they're critically ill, and they will be hypoxemic despite pre-oxygenation. We have a lot of unexpected, unexpected difficult airways, and associated high risk for numerous critical I incidents and uh, adverse events. And when you take a look at it, there are actually a notably high rate of failure of the primary uh, intubation attempt. And we, we actually, we do need to get the tube in uh, fairly quickly. As you see from this slide, that when the number of attempts, attempts at, at airway management uh, or the intubation attempts increase, so does the, uh, the, uh, uh, the complications, they increase exponentially, almost. So the patients, they're sick, they, most of them have shunt physiology, they have increased O2 uh, dema demands, a lot of them are obese, they might be pregnant, and they may impede our attempts at pre-oxygenate them. And many of these patients may have a, from an anatomically uh, point of view, they may have a normal airway, but they may, the things may turn ugly even in an anatomically normal airway. Another, another thing, don't peak too early. A lot of these problems will occur after intubation. 
So in terms of what kills our patients, these are hemodynamic problems, oxygenation problems, and uh, low pH. And this is, uh, and I give thanks to Scott Weingart for coining these terms of the hop killers. And um, I, I know that uh, at least Michael, know, you know uh, both Scott and, and, uh, and Rich who coined this term. So in terms of hemodynamics, we all know that shock is a problem. When you start anesthetizing patients with shock, they might go into cardiac arrest. This is something that we tell each other. But how often does this happen? And when is it actually a problem? Well, there's not a lot of publications, and most publications are retrospective. But uh, I was able to found uh, three publications. And in about, if you have patients <coughs> with a systolic blood pressure below 90, you will encounter cardiac arrest in about 1.7 to 4.2 percent of these cases. So when your patients are in shock, do something to correct that shock before you start intubating. Otherwise, you will risk cardiac arrest. So next step is oxygenation. And this is um, really a, a big deal, I guess. Um, at least so I'm told. And it is a problem, because if we have patients that are hypoxic when we start, they will be likely to desaturate when we start uh, doing airway management. So if you start up with an oxygen saturation around 93, 95, you will be highly likely to uh, desaturate during airway management. And when you get below 70% uh, saturation, then dysrhythmia, hemodynamic compromise, shock, and cardiac arrest uh, comes fairly quickly. And from study in uh, an old study from 2005 by, by Mort uh, actually showed that our attempts at pre-oxygenating pre these patients, this is less effective actually. So we're in uh, stuck in kind of a problem here. So the next step is um, the low pH, the severely metabolic patients. And we all have a specific number. I guess you stand this and we have the patient is, is, is acidotic. Well, we need to get above seven point something. And I could ask any of you, and you also, you all will have, well, my number is 7.15, mine is 7.2. And <coughs> I can actually tell you what my number is because I don't know. But the thing is that there's actually, there is experimental and animal work that shows that uh, when you get acidemic, the proteins doesn't work and you need to correct that to get the proteins to work. But giving bicarbon doesn't work. It doesn't really give you anything. So what should we do? We have to back up. And this guy, I've been working with Michael for the last 15 years, I guess, and he's been telling me we must have a plan. And I sort of thought about this a little bit further, and I watched this movie, fantastic movie, The Untouchables, and he said, what are you prepared to do? And the thing is, you don't want, like Sean Connery says in this movie, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. So you need to be prepared. You need to have, your, to have your yourself and your organization prepared. You need to have specific airway cards. You know you need to have these updated. You need to know what's what are in these drop kits in these cards. You need to be prepared. And this is really a, a really good mental framework for yourself and your team to know when is enough is enough. When do we proceed to? Uh, frontier uh, neck axis. So how about predicting difficult uh, airway management? There's not a lot of work out there. This is the Makoka score. I never used it, but what is interesting is that it relies on several factors. And as you see the ones from the, the arrows, that, that some of them are related to pathology and some of them are correctable. So you can actually push your patient further 
down in these scores, which is something that you need to do. And as Michael already told you, you need to know how to find your ultimate bailout, the frontier neck axis. And if things get problematic, you need to know how to use ultrasound. And we'll teach you that uh, later tonight. And uh, you'll all go away from that workshop saying, I, I know how to master this. You need to know, you need to get help. And don't be too proud. I learned this after one week in, uh, in the department. I was called into an operating room with the, uh, say, you need to come now. We have a difficult airway. And at the head of the bed was Michael. I said, what do you need me for? I've been here for one week. And it's not about experience. Of course, it's also about experience. But it's about collective, collectively having a plan and setting up, uh, setting up that plan together. So you need to get help. Don't be shy. Don't be too proud. This is about saving patients' lives. You also have to be, do a bit of Feng Shui. Uh, this is actually a fantastic environment to handle critically ill patients. It's a terrible environment to handle airways. So you need to do something about this before you start handling airways. And in the, uh, the difficult airway society guidelines are actually different schemes for, for setting up your airway, uh, your airway uh, uh, setup. This is just one way of doing it, and there are several ways of doing it. And this is something you need to do in your hospital. You need to do it pre-hospitally. This is a fantastic picture where you actually see that they feng sweet away from the sun, and everything is, uh, is set up fantastically to handle these airways. You need proper suction. You need to set up a double suction. You need to set up a large bore suction. And I think we will touch on that tonight also. And I know the salad guys are here too. So uh, they will show you how to use proper suction. And also what Michael says, you need to learn a blind technique. And we obviously endorse the retrograde technique, which we will teach you tonight. So resuscitate before intubate. Fluid resuscitation is the cornerstone of any hemodynamic resuscitation, and you need to also start up some vasopressors. You need to aim for a higher than normal blood pressure. What is this blood pressure? We actually don't know, but aim for something that is higher than normal. You need to dose smart. Set up with low dose anesthetics high dose paralytics and start vasopressor infusion before you start giving anything. You can do vasopressor infusion via an IV line. You don't need a central line. Actually, a pretty good review came out last year. There's actually no need uh, to do a central line. You can do it in an anticubital, uh, uh, anticubital vein. Of course, you need that needs to be a good vein, no backwalling, so you need so you don't get any extravasation. But this is something that you need to do. And local anesthetics, have them ready both as topical anesthesia, but if you think that you might go the ultimate route in the anterior neck, have local anesthetic installed before you actually go on through your first attempt at, at intubation. And I think there's a indication for awake intubation in these patients. Don't say that awake intubation or sedated intubation with spontaneous ventilation is only for patients with airway pathology. These patients might be so sick that they can't take any form of, uh, any form of uh, anesthetics. So do an awake intubation. Put the tube in and then dose the anesthetic really, really slowly. So I remember when I started uh, in anesthesia. I was told that, an that oxygen is, is a big deal, which most of us know. And do you remember when you had to do your first intubation? I do. It was scary shit. Do you also remember when you had to do your first RSI? Even scarier. I got to think of 
I got the same feeling with the pre-oxygenation as when I ran a paper route as a child. Uh, you came up to these houses where you knew there was a big dog. So you brought some dog biscuits and you just threw them in the back of the garden and you ran for dear life. And that's how I feel about uh, pre-oxygenation. Um, so in time you get more relaxed, you, you, uh, you may get a bit sloppy uh, with the pre-oxygenation and that's actually because most of our patients will do all right without pre-oxygenation. If we have patients way to the left here in the green zone, these are A ASA1 patients, ASA1 or 2 for elective surgery, they have no lung pathology there. Fit and young and healthy, you can actually do no pre-oxygenation, they will do just fine. On the other hand, patients to the right, starting out hypoxemic, they may be obese, they may be with COPD, they may have pulmonary infection. These are the patients that need pre-oxygenation. And as I told you, as uh, saturations go down, things start getting problematic. So we coined the term peri-intubation peri oxy peri oxygenation. And oxygenation needs not only to happen as pre-oxygenation, this is something that needs to happen from the get-go before induction, during laryngoscopy, during intubation, and afterwards until the transition to positive pressure ventilation. And there's la actually a lot of ways to do this. And we, uh, we came up with uh, five different ways of, uh, of uh, doing something different or optimizing the techniques that you already know. So just normal pre-oxygenation. This is basic stuff. This is something that you all know. We pre-oxygenate. We try to push the patient way to the right on this curve. We try to fill up the functional residual capacity. We try to increase the safe apnea time. So the safe apnea time is, by definition, the time it takes the patients to desaturate to about 88 to 90 percent. So this is what we try to we try to increase these. Uh, these, uh, this time. Normally, we will, as in, in anesthesia, we will put on a very tight sealed mask. We'll have the patients breathing for three minutes or we'll have them do eight vital capacity breaths. We'll try to have them exhale fully so we'll optimize all these uh, things. But I really encourage you to start looking at the end tidal oxygen. These are all on our anesthetic monitors. And if you push the patient up around 90% or at least above 80%, this is a good marker of denitrogenation. It's a good marker of uh, pre-oxygenation. If you're outside the uh, operating room away from a uh, anesthetic machine, you can also use the combination of a nasal cannula or, and or a uh, reservoir mask uh, on flush rate and that is actually comparable to uh, a non-rebreather or a anesthetic machine. Uh, this is non this shown in a non-inferior study that this will also work. There's been a lot of talk whether you should use FiO2s of 100% or 80%. I, I think it's uh, it's not really an issue in, uh, in, uh, in critically ill patients so go for 100 and dial down the O2, of course, when you can see that you had your pa have your patients significantly uh, intubated and, uh, and oxygenated. So positioning the patient, let gravity be your friend. If you have patients lying down, it will be more difficult to take full breaths you'll be more prone to posterior at atelectasis, so you need to sit up. And I guess if you look at this guy, you see where the problem is. He will, if you lie him on his back, he will have his lungs way up uh, around his shoulders. So actually there's a lot of uh, good, uh, small but really good uh, studies uh, that uh, all show that if you have the patient sitting up, 
uh, they will increase their safe apnea time by 20 to 30 percent compared to patients in the supine position. So sit them up. Maybe you should leave them sitting, because there's also a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there's some studies that actually show that intubating patients in the semi-sitting position is actually easier, less complication. So maybe you should leave them sitting. So CPAP, apply CPAP. So this is uh, the problem. You have a patient, you're pre-oxygenating them, but they won't come more than 89, 90%. And this is the hallmark of uh, shunt physiology. And you remember from your, your late textbooks that these are part of the lungs that are perfused but not ventilated. So filled up with fluids, uh, filled up with a or atelectic from uh, being uh, bedridden for, for weeks on or the obese patient and even just having patients in anesthesia per se will cause atelectasis. And as I told you, the hallmark is that we can dial up O2 as much as we want. This will not have any effect on the saturation at all. What we need is uh, to apply PEEP. And I think that, let's see if this will work. Can you press this video, I guess? Yeah. I think this is, an exp this is obviously an experimental. I think it's a rap rapid lung. Let's see uh, if you can push it. All right, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, all right, so what you see on this is, uh, is when you increase PEEP, Actually, the lung uh, parts will fill up really, really good. So it's uh, it's very um, illustrative of, of PEEP uh, working. Um, quite a lot of studies also that however you measure oxygenation, PEEP versus no PEEP will increase oxygenation, will increase safe apnea time. So this is something that you also need to consider or uh, do. And it should be coupled to recruitment maneuvers, ongoing PEEP, CPAP, uh, after intubation. So this is something that should be coupled. Apneic oxygenation is something that is really, really popular. The fact that you apply high flow oxygen above the uh, glottic area and you can actually oxygenate further down just by Having the patient, uh, having uh, the patient, uh, just high flow oxygen. So in normal breathing, we have O2 passing in, CO2 going out. So the O2 passing out uh, will actually cause a negative uh, pressure in the lungs, and it will it, it, it will cause this negative pressure and a suction effect. So you will actually suction uh, O2 down from the nasal cavity. Uh, so this will actually it this this will maintain oxygenation for a very long time, and this depends on uh, there's difference between uh, FiO2 in spontaneous versus apneic patients, and it it uh, it is coupled to how fast is your breathing rate. So of course, if you have a high breathing rate, your FiO2 will go down. But if you can match the ventilatory rate, you can actually keep a very high FiO2 in the nasal pharynx and you can actually keep up uh, oxygenation for quite a bit. This is something that we've known for years. It's been known through as diffuse respiration, apneic diffuse oxygenation or air ventilatory mass flow oxygenation. It's been, I think the first publication is from 1959, so this is something that we've known for years. But in uh, 2010 this uh, study came with uh, little piglets where they uh, actually administered uh, oxygen and uh, they concluded that this is something that really works and they put this in their conclusion. This might be implemented in airway algorithms for intubation hypoxemic patients and then things really took away and via social media, uh, via of course the SMAC organization, uh, a lot of podcasting this really took uh, took off. So right now, there's 
basically two different ways of doing this. There's the nasal oxygenation during efforts securing a tube and the transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilation, or no DSAT and thrive. So the no DSAT is what is actually most recommendable in the critically ill. This is because it relies on standard equipment, standard nasal cannula. This is something that we all have in our basic setup. Whereas the Thrive relies on special equipment, this is something that is in most uh, intensive care units now, but it's not something that we have as a standard setup e in the emergency department. So I would recommend using the no, no DSAT and actually a coined term by Rich Leviton. This is not something that is a substitute for good pre-oxygenation, it's merely an adjunct. Um, a lot of good studies, small but good studies, show that if you apply uh, high flow oxygen above the, uh, the, the glottic area, then you'll increase the time to the patient's desaturation. This has been shown in the OR, in obese patients. It's been done in the pre-hospital setting where introdu introduction of a, uh, of a uh, protocol using this actually decreased the, uh, the incidence of hypoxemia, uh, hypoxemia during intubation. And just last year, uh, there was a systemic uh, or no, systematic uh, review that said there's strong evidence of benefit in electric surgical patients, obese patients, and emergency patients without respirat respiratory failure. Because if you look at patients with respiratory failure, the evidence becomes so-so. Um, so that's, the, that's where it's, it's at right now. It's not a divine intervention, but it, at least it's a, it's a benign intervention. Uh, so my take on this is it's just do it. Put a nasal cannula, uh, 15 liters. The patient will tolerate this. They won't complain. It's for a very shor uh, short while. And you can fit your mask over the nasal cannula. Just do it. All right. So uh, the next piece of the puzzle is uh, the delayed sequence intubation. They can't pre-oxygenate patient. These are all patients that you've met. This is a guy from, uh, from our uh, uh, OR. I met him. He's 45 years old. I met him in the hepatic ICU. Liver failure, progressive liver failure, progressively uh, encephal encephalopathic, hypoxic. And he was, uh, he was hypoxic with a saturation of 78, and he was really refusing to having the mask on. Even whatever we did, is just push the mask away. So one thing, you can be del delirious, but it can also be because we're not meeting this patient's uh, negative inspiratory flow rate. We need to do something else. Dealing with these patients, the odds are stacked against you. We are, as I told you, we are actually charting uh, unfamiliar waters, hypoxemia, pretty uh, problematic. And whatever you do, this is what you risk. You risk a slap on the face, patients desaturating if you don't do your work first. So we normally, this is our go-to, rapid sequence intubation. Push an, an anesthetic a paralytic, intubate them, no problem. But I urge you to, in these patients, delay this sequence. Put in a sedative, then put a step in of pre-oxygenation, then put your paralytic in, then do no, uh, and then do uh, put in the, and then uh, do no ventilation, and then intubate. This is the ideal drug, ketamine. I don't think you can overdose on ketamine. If you put in little aliquots, titrate it to effect, the patient will maintain spontaneous ventilation. Only if you push it in high doses, they will become apneic for a short while, then will come back again. But this is not something that you want. Just titrate it slowly. You can't overdose it. And when the patient is good, ready, sedated, do pre-oxygenations, and this is the sequence. The patient is deliric, hypoxic, 
This is my starting dose, S-ketamine 0.5 to 2 milligrams, just slowly push it in, then pre-oxygenate, uh, administer to paralytic, and then intubate. And this is something that not only facilitates intubation, but it actually gives you some really added benefits. Positioning, CPAP, awake intubation, put it in NG tubes, apneic oxygenation, all the things I told you before. But most important, it gives you time, it gives you control. So I tend to think of ketamine more along a L an LA drug more than a hemodynamic drug. We did a study uh, a few years ago uh, in a critically ill patient and then actually it, this worked. So significantly improvement of uh, uh, saturation prior to intubation. Uh, so the last few years, these, uh, these techniques have been somewhat improved, uh, where you can facilitate pre-oxygenation, intubation. Uh, when you have the patient sedated, uh, you can put in a, uh, in a uh, superglottic airway. Uh, this is known as the, uh, the rapid sequence airway, the RSA, or the pharmacologically assisted laryngeal mask insertion, the PALM. Uh, these are all very useful concepts, and but there's not a lot of studies on it, but it, it might also work. All right, so putting all these things together, uh, you, you have some patient factors, you have an, uh, a, a saturation and it somewhat gives you a risk assessment and you have to put on some of these different, uh, different techniques of uh, increasing oxygen, oxygenation. All right, so now the, uh, how to handle these, uh, these acidemic patients. This is really difficult stuff. But this is the prime example of airway management in, uh, in the critical ill. Because you need to stop, you need to think, and you need to ask yourself some questions. Why is this patient acidotic? Can I correct it? But most of all, do I really have to intubate this patient right now? What is the benefit of intubating this patient right now? So if you can avoid intubating these patients, please do correct the acidosis, and then consider, do we still need intubation? Don't give bicarbonate, as I told you, it will only increase CO2 production. Uh, correct the underlying cause if possible. If you need to support ventilation, do it by non-invasive non, uh, uh, non uh, non ventilation techniques. Um, and, but if intubation is unavoidable, I urge you to not do an RSI, do a DSI, the delayed sequence intubation, have the patient's pre-oxygenation with the ventilator on a supportive mode, be aware of air trapping, you have to, you have to, uh, ma you have to match the patient's respiratory flow, uh, and uh, when you intubate them, be aware that they might be air trapping on the ventilator, PEEP might be problematic in these patients. So. Resuscitate before intubation. So these are my take home messages. What are you prepared to do? Be prepared. Check your organization, check yourself. Be aware of the hop killers. Get help, feng shui your environment. Dose smart, use awake intubation for the hemodynamically uh, compromised patient. Oxygenate, 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 and avoid intubating the uh, severely acidotic patients. All right, that was it. So, Wendy.
Hi everyone, don't go away. You've been a great audience. Just bear with me another 12 minutes before the coffee break. Can you hear me at the back? Yay. I'm Wendy from Singapore. An absolute privilege to be back here this year. Wait, I need a clicker. Okay, good to go. Oh, there we are.
was this uh, it was an 18-year-old daughter of a retired serviceman who was brought to the oral medicine service, aptly named, all right, who had four days previously flossing her teeth, otherwise asymptomatic, while basically she was bleeding in there, all right. And I just highlight a few uh, um, interesting comments, all right. The likely cause of these palatal petechiae was the combined actions of the levator valley palatini and tensor valley palatini muscles, all this fine print I didn't even know about, all right, and the pressure produced in the posterior oropharynx by irrumation. These two forces in the richly vascular area of the palatine aponeurosis probably produce the submucosal hemorrhages, blah, blah, blah. I thought I spoke pretty good English, but I didn't even know what that word meant, so I went to Wikipedia. And Iru Martio means the act of thrusting of the penis into the mouth or throat between the legs, breast, feet, or upper thighs. So it's basically a blowjob and more, right? Okay, so this was my literature search. <laughs> now, it wasn't entirely an airway management problem. There were consent issues too, right? Because, you know, they didn't, they wanted to protect her modesty and everything. So they agreed after speaking to her with the patient's consent that they would tell the father that, oh, she swallowed a tetracycline pill the wrong way a couple of days ago and she choked on it or something. So I don't know whether that's allowed nowadays, but it's just how that story ended out of interest, all right? Um, another literature search showed that uh, chicken bone was another cause of uh, traumatic hematoma of the soft palate. Uh, this was in the Journal of Laryngology and Autology in December 91, and it was uh, the patient, uh, the patient was actually a guy who had been on a cruise ship and stopped at a port of call. Um, interestingly, on myself, I uh, actually used a video laryngoscope to remove a fish bone from my own palatopharyngeal palate once before. And if there's any medical students here in the audience uh, who might not know how a video laryngoscope works, basically it allows you a wider look because it, it doesn't, you don't need to align the oropharyngeal and tracheal axes to get a look around the corner when you have a camera placed at the distal one third of the blade. So for example, video laryngoscopy gives you a, a viewer, a wider viewing angle. So this same principle of look around the corner is in all the video laryngoscopes. And, I, and even in the new ASA difficult airway algorithm guidelines now, if you think you're gonna have a difficult intubation, video assisted laryngoscopy is now advocated as the initial approach to intubation. These are the common ones we have in the Asia Pacific region. And I got together with a few uh, key video laryngoscopists from Australia and New Zealand, and we grouped them into three groups so it would be easier for the novices to understand. So this group is called the Macintosh-like video laryngoscopes. You insert it like a normal video, uh, normal Macintosh blade, and you displace the tongue anterolaterally, you flatten the submandibular tissues. And these would be like the C-Mac, the McGrath Mac, the AP Advanced. Then you have the angulated video laryngoscopes, which are the Glidescopes, the C-Mac D-Blade, and the McGrath Series 5. To intubate successfully, you need a J-shaped stylet, you insert it in the midline, all right? Then you have the channel video laryngoscopes, of which they are mentioned there, the AirTrack, the Kentex, the King Vision, and the AP Advanced Difficult Airway Blades. Now, how do they compare in difficult airways? I'm just gonna summarize for you. This was expert intubators doing a mannequin study in 720 patients trying out like seven different types of video laryngoscopes. They put a cervical collar on. This restricts mouth opening, all right? 10 intubations with each device was the level of proficiency for each intubator. And they looked at the overall success in maximum two attempts. And what they found was that the first attempt success, you can see they're pretty dismal, some of the uh, results there. They're not really uh, close to the 90% or 100% uh, range. And these are the kind of problems they encountered with the, they couldn't advance the tube, they couldn't see properly, et cetera. And so why is that? So the take home slide from this is that sometimes one video laryngoscope is gonna not gonna suit all your patient characteristics, all right? Scurries. You all see a lot of trauma, okay? So that's why we're all here in this setting. What about C-spine protection, manual inline stabilization? Video laryngoscopy, especially the angulated blades, apparently you're gonna get better first attempt intubation, okay? But it might not make your C-spine movement more protected. In order to protect the C-spine movement, you should use flexible fiber optic intubation. What, if, what about if they have limited mouth opening with a abscess? Then a video laryngoscope is gonna be faster compared to a direct laryngoscope. What about in the emergency department? 
if you compare a Macintosh versus an angulated video rendering scope, for the more difficult error predictive situation has, then you should use the angulated video laser scope, like the glide scope or one with an anterior blade. What about trauma patients? And these were non-expert intubators. Well, interestingly, even the use of the glide scope video laryngoscope resulted in more mortality because the they had longer intubation time. And uh, with severe head injury, with the hypoxemia, et cetera, then these patients had higher mortality. So just be mindful, you need to track this beforehand. Um, of interest to us, what about in the high altitude glaciers? And this study was actually done here just in Jung, Jungfrau. You have the sun, the glare, and everything. How do we, which, which video laryngoscope is going to perform well? And this is a mannequin study, all right? They took the mannequin indoors, they did it at high altitude, the physicians put on sunglasses, they took off their sunglasses, they took the, gla the mannequin out to the glacier, and they covered themselves with a blanket. So how did they perform? And they compared these different video laryngoscopes. Well, basically what they found was that in bright direct sunlight, the Macintosh performed better than any of the video laryngoscopes. Wearing sunglasses, mm, a bit iffy, may help, may not help, all right? And the intubation times greatly differ between devices. And what is the, the, the problem? It's the glare, it's just like using your mobile phones, you know, the glare from the video laryngoscope. So the conclusion that if it's a bright sunlight, then video laryngoscopes might work less. You should cover your head with a blanket. That's gonna help when you intubate patients outside in the bright sunlight. So in summary, different strokes for different folks. However, we, we just went through these different categories. But please be mindful, video laryngoscopes are not gonna work for all patient types. If you have these kind of small um, mouth, huge goiters, radiation changes, masses, severe micronathia, then the video laryngoscopes might not work and you might still have to fall back on the flexible fiber optic intubation. And if the video laryngoscope and the flexible optical scope's not gonna work, then you know the answer. What do pussies, blowjobs, and airways have in common? And that's why you need to come to the bar tonight. It's going to be the international premiere of this mannequin we've designed to show you the bleeding airway and different techniques that you can use to intubate a bloody airway. There'll be mannequins that are supine. There will be faculty that are supine. <laughs> come and be educated and entertained. Thank you very much. So thank you guys for an awesome airway presentation. Um, we're gonna do a few minutes now for questions. Uh, is that okay? Could you mm -hmm. three please come up here and we'll take questions from the audience for a couple of minutes. Yes, sir, so. Question, question for Michael, I think. Uh, you talked about retrograde intubation uh, via, the ne via the nose. How do you do that? Do you put another uh, epidural catheter in the nose and, and then tie a knot? Two points. First, of course, in most of these situations, you would just do an, an, an oral intubation first to secure, to, uh, to be able to move on. But actually, it's, it's uh, quite easy to, uh, to transfer this to an ACE intubation. What you do is you do the procedure you saw here. Once you've got the catheter out the mouth, you just place a normal suction, air, suction catheter through the nose into the mouth. You take out the suction catheter either with your fingers or the forceps, then you put the, the catheter into the suction catheter, you know, out the mouth and out here. I've got nice uh, pictures of that as well, but I didn't think of it as, as necessary in the emergency situation. Thank you for asking. So actually with this, when I travel to Greenland, for instance, I bring this uh, epidural catheter, then I can do a big intubation in, in almost all patients in case I need it. A very cheap way, and even in sunlight. <laughs> okay, thanks for that question. Yes, please. With with the no, um, it's actually to you, Michael. Yes. Uh, you s you sometimes have a problem actually getting the tube uh, through the larynx because you 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 get the the flange of the tube uh -huh. butting against the larynx. Correct. When you go when you do the the um, the, the, the the retrograde, yes. do you ever have that sort of problem? You and how can do you solve it? As you all know, as long as you have something uh, dysproportional in in uh, diameter, you can have a problem. So exactly as with, for instance introducing a tube over a stylet where you can have hang up at the epiglottis, at the erythenoid region, at the, at the uh, fault or through vocal cord, you can have that as well. 
with uh, retrograde intubation, yes. So you can make a small rotation maneuver uh, until you are sure that it's not hung up and then introduce it. That's why I recommend, if you have the resources and the time, to do CO2 confirmation before, uh, before you put the patient to sleep because, yes, you may have failures in that aspect as well. You can also, that several other techniques have dem demonstrated where you put a flexible optical scope through the tube. Once you've got it there, then you can verify where you are, maybe despite of bleeding, because now you see the tracheal rings or an introducer to that one. That just makes it more complicated, but there are ways of coming around this. But thank you for pointing that out. There are probably not one, uh, one technique that is 100% fail safe. Thank you. We may be able to practice that. Just one practical question, Michael. Have why did you end up with the with the um, with the catheter, and why did don't you use the normal Seidringer wire or just this wire which is included in the percutane um, uh, the hostoma sets? What Good. is a little bit more? That's easy to answer. The wire itself only works as a sm thin guide and the tube is several millimeters larger, meaning that you will easily have hang up on if it got everything or the region. So that's why a wire itself is less useful. Then you have to induce a second step with a small tube on the wire and then the ventilation tube, then it gets complicated. That's the reason for choosing that. The reason for choosing the epidural catheter, instead of the dedicated kit that you can buy, the dedicated kits cost you 600, uh, no, 300 uh, Swiss francs, and you don't have it when you need it, at least. I don't see it, but, but I can always, please bring me every dual cat or I have it in the pocket. So that's why, and actually that's what we use. But thank you for that question as well. Yeah, so just another comment uh, for, uh, for, for the hang-up part. Uh, when you introduce the, uh, the catheter via the cricothyroid membrane, uh, the, the angle might be a bit steep uh, just below the vocal cord. So you, you, you tend to get... Um, a very steep angle and a more hang up just for when you when you switch from the the pull to the push part of the uh, of the retrograde intubation. So if you have a longer uh, a longer tracheal uh, trachea, it might be more beneficial to do trans tracheal, not trans crico. So just go down to the second second or third uh, tracheal space. Uh, of course, you risk the there's a lot more risk of uh, having posterior wall, uh, back wall puncture, but it's uh, that, that decreases your angle. So, and good lubrication also of the catheter. Thank you for that comment. You have to um, only have to go one level further down. That is below the cricoid. That gives you one more centimeter, and then you at the cricotracheal membrane that has been published as well gives you a better angle. Yes. So thank you. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions at. Um, this exact we point have time, time but, but there will be a lot of time tonight to corner these people and ask them more questions. Um, we have some important announcements before we uh, get a 15 minute coffee break. I'm also show a short video, but uh, Ollie is reminding me that
here's the video for what will happen during the week and uh, of course we'll make some more videos during the week so here's a little uh, video any man be alone what you calls me to leave child my happy home. welcome to Zermatt <laughs> but someday baby bienvenue a Zermatt